All right, well, welcome back to uh, New Thirst Addiction Ministries One Step to Freedom Addiction Recovery Program. Um, if this is your first time, you know, tuning in, to, uh, watching, listening, whatever it is that you're doing with this, uh, this is a faith based recovery program. It's based on one step to freedom. Um, that one step is admitting uh, that we are sitters and putting our faith and our trust uh, in God and not of ourselves. Um, we're about halfway through with this program right now. Um, and we just finished up James. We're getting into uh, chapter five. Um, we finished up James. James is uh, a book of action, a book, a book of doing, a book of um, applying uh, God's word to our lives and living out uh, the things that we learn in the Bible and that God teaches us. Um, in fact, one of the lessons in that was being uh, doers and not just hearers only. It does no good for us to just say that we that we believe it. Uh, to make pretty much, um, you know, an empty confession of our faith saying, oh yeah, I believe in God, uh, and, and not live that kind of a lifestyle anymore, not continuing to live, I'm sorry, uh, to say that we believe in God and then not live a godly lifestyle and to continue living lifestyles in the world. And, and many people, including myself at one point in my life, have fallen into that trap where we say that we believe, um, but then we continue doing things that we know are not godly. In fact, there's a... Uh, um, a section in James in James chapter 2 that talks about um, uh, faith without works being dead and, and go, you can go back and and watch the lessons and get more into that I don't want to get super far into that before I get started though I do want to say welcome this is uh, it's it's a it's a faith-based recovery program so it's open to anybody it's open to everybody um, regardless of your age or, or anything like that uh, and you don't have to be struggling with an addiction it's because it's a faith-based um, program it's basically a Bible study uh, and uh, also, as always, if you or somebody you know would like to request a, uh, a paper Bible, um, contact me. You can go to the website, www.soberforchrist.com. I'll put my email, the website, the Facebook link down in the description below. Um, and you can just send me a request on there. The website also has uh, a lot of other good tools and resources on it, including an AA meeting finder. I haven't put one on there for uh, NA yet there's also a calvary chapel church finder on there but if you need to request a bible request prayer um, request help finding a, a bible teaching church that's important not just a church but a church that teaches the bible um, or um, you know have questions or, or comments or other things like that just uh, feel free to um, send me a message there's a there's a message uh, form on the um, website so uh, anyway i should have done that before i started talking about james but we'll just continue on. Um, so we talked about James, we talked about applying uh, what we've learned, uh, not just in this class, but what we learn in our reading and study of the Bible, which remember if we talked about um, back in the very beginning in one of the first, uh, the first uh, lessons, uh, definitely in the first chapter, it talks about um, having a, a daily devotional life and so as we go through our daily devotional life which we're talking about prayer um, not necessarily going through a, uh, a a devotion book but going through the bible devoting time to prayer devoting time to listening to god and studying his scripture we need to also apply those things to our lives so we went through that and this chapter we're going to start talking about spiritual warfare and what spiritual warfare is and how it affects us uh, in our walk uh, not just as Christians, but also as, you know, uh, people that used to be uh, enslaved to sin. We're no longer slaves to sin. Uh, we doesn't mean that we don't sin, but we fight a battle now that we didn't fight before. Um, people that don't uh, know God, that don't follow God, that don't follow the Bible, they're not even going to know about the this battle. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, but it's because when, uh, you're, when you're living in the world, when you're living a, a life of sin, Satan doesn't care about you. You're doing your own thing. It's when you start to walk away uh, that uh, you start having this battle. And it's because when you start walking away from him and to God, I should say, uh, is when you start having this battle because um, he doesn't want to see you uh, succeed in anything. His goal is death. Uh, remember that um, with the first man, with the first sin, with Adam, that is where death entered the world, and now death reigns. Um, <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 3, during the fall of man, uh, it says, um, Well, God had told Adam and Eve, uh, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of uh, good and evil, and uh, if you do, that you will die. And Satan was dece uh, deceitful, and 
you know, said, well, you will not surely die. You'll just become like God, which was a, a prideful and selfish thing. Uh, uh, that's, you know, that's why most sin is uh, derived from pride and selfishness. Actually, all sin is derived from pride and selfishness in one way or another. Um, and, uh, but he said, you will not surely die. But uh, they did. There was a spiritual death. There was a separation from God. And where they probably would have lived uh, eternally um, without sin, uh, because there was no death, now there is also a physical death to go along with it. But nonetheless, spiritual warfare is um, it is a thing. It is something that goes on in uh, the believer's life. So what is spiritual warfare? In this lesson, we're just going to kind of talk about and explain what spiritual warfare is. And if you want to, uh, we're going to go through all of the spiritual warfare in this chapter uh, and go through quite a bit in Ephesians. But if you want to go find... Um, where the Bible really talks about spiritual warfare and putting on the, the whole armor of God to, to fight this battle, to fight this spiritual warfare. You can find it in Ephesians chapter 6. It uh, starts in verse 10 and goes through verse uh, 17, I believe. Um, and then, uh, well, I mean, you can just read through the end of the chapter, ver read through verse 20. It's all relevant. Uh, but when we start talking about the armor of God and putting on the armor of God, it runs through um, verse 17 in Ephesians chapter 6. Um, starting in verse 10. So we're just going to talk about what spiritual warfare is and, and explain it. And, and hopefully by the time that you know we leave here today, you'll have a better understanding and then we'll just get more in depth as we continue to go along. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers, against, I'm sorry, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Uh, it's not flesh, although that there is peer pressure that would cause us to sin or cause us to be in our addictions. It's a spiritual warfare that goes on. It's a constant battle to try to bring us to death. The beauty of it is, is that once we are saved, we, we put off the old man, we put on the new man. There is, there is no eternal spiritual death that can take us down but that doesn't mean that they won't try and it, it will make our lives miserable we have there's a warfare that's going on and we need to uh we need to learn how to fight it off uh the the, the evil um the principalities and the powers and the darkness um of this age we, we need to learn how to battle that uh fight that war um and when i say we need to learn how to fight that war i mean we need to learn how to let god fight it because it's not a it's not a it's not a battle that we can fight and ever overcome. The only way to win this battle is through uh, God. So in this lesson, we want to clarify what spiritual warfare is and how it relates to those who are overcoming addictions through uh, God's grace. And here's some commonly asked questions when it comes to spiritual warfare, because like I said, um, even Christians, a lot of them don't necessarily understand the, the spiritual warfare. Um, I say baby Christians, you know, new Christians, which is kind of what this program is designed to do. It's, you know, you, you, you didn't walk into this knowing everything that there was about the Bible. Otherwise, you might not need to be here. Again, it's a Bible study, so you, you know, it's open to everybody. And I, I go to this program at my church, and obviously I teach uh, this program here. I teach it at the church sometimes because it's good to go and get into God's Word. It's just another Bible study. But, you know, somebody that just became a Christian, somebody that just, you know, turned their life over to God, and it's the first time that they've ever picked up a Bible in their life, none of this is going to make any sense. So we're going to talk about those commonly asked questions, um, and we're going to um, give some scriptures that will apply to this. Um, you know, I, I don't know why I typed that there, because it says write it in. It's assuming that you have the worksheet and the curriculum that we have, um, which, by the way, I'm working on putting on the website. Um, it's just going to be a little while. Things got busy at work, and I don't have as much time to do that. I don't even really have time to make these videos. But uh, we want to clarify what spiritual warfare is and how it relates to those of us who are overcoming addictions and maybe still struggling and, and really just coming <clears throat> overcoming sin that's in our life. Um, I was talking to uh, a friend of mine uh, from a church that I used to attend, and he said, man, I got so sick and tired of hearing about my addiction and, and this and that, and that's why he had quit um, attending our the, the Zoom meeting and really going to AA and anything else like that. And then one of the things I want to say about it is, is we look at this, it says overcoming addictions, but we can right here, overcoming addictions, but we can replace that with just overcoming sin and temptation. It doesn't have to be an addiction. Um, it is relatable 
to all of the sin in our life and all of the temptations that we will have. Uh, spiritual warfare is an everyday constant battle between the devil uh, and his fallen angels uh, or the demons against God, his angels, and his people. That's us. We are his people. Um, it's, a, it's a constant battle that's going on. There's a, there's a constant battle that's going on around us, and we can't ever see it. You know, especially when, when it comes to addictions, when you, when you talk to some people, you know, they say that they're, they're battling demons that nobody else can see. Um, you know, when somebody's going through a, uh, a hard time in their life, you know, people will say things like that they're fighting a battle. Uh, you, don't, you're, you don't know what kind of a battle that they're fighting, so don't judge them. And this is true. There is constantly this warfare going on around us, although they might not really necessarily understand that the fact uh, that there is actually a spiritual battle going on around us constantly um, because they're not believers. It's something that is constantly going on. There is always, you know, fiery darts. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, not in this lesson, but in an upcoming lesson, talking about... Um, the shield of faith, which will quench all the fiery darts from the wicked one. There's constant attacks. There's this constant warfare that's going on around us. And like I said, it's a battle that we can't win. It's not, um, it's not a battle that, that mankind could win. Uh, if it was a battle that mankind could win, um, we, we wouldn't be in the situation that we are in. We were tempted. We were given free will. We were given the ability to make choices. In the very beginning, I'm talking about Adam and Eve, and we made, I'm sorry, I mean, we made the wrong choice. We made um, a selfish decision instead of following God's commands and um, letting him fight the battle for us. <clears throat> so why is there spiritual warfare? All men will live eternally. You know, we talk about you can have eternal life uh, if you come to, uh, to God. This is true. That's not a wrong statement at all because there can also be eternal death. Um, the, the, the death is not a spiritual death, or I'm sorry, not a physical death, it's a spiritual death, and it comes from separation from God. You have eternal life, which is uh, an eternal spiritual life in the presence of God, or you have an eternal death, which is a spiritual death, separation from, uh, separation from God. Um, so we're all going to live eternally, uh, either with God in his kingdom, or with Satan and his followers, angels, in a place that was prepared for them. Remember, um, hell or the lake of fire, it was not ever intended for man. It was only ever intended for Satan and the fallen angels. But God is holy and God is just. And as such, he cannot look on sin. And uh, so those of us that die in sin, that die in the flesh, without putting our faith in him and having been saved by grace through faith, um, which you can find in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, um, we we have no choice on the judgment day because we didn't follow him or we, it's not not that we don't have any choice he has no choice and it's what's going to happen um we will spend eternity separated from god with satan and his angels the fallen angels in um, the lake of fire or in hell once a person becomes a believer he is in opposition of satan therefore the object of the spiritual warfare is for the devil to steal kill and destroy uh, souls eternally. Now, this doesn't mean that you can lose your salvation um, unless you completely just renounce your faith in God to, at that point, the question would have to be asked, did you ever have faith in God? Because once you truly know him and you have that relationship with him, you don't want to leave it. Like, you know, people say, ah, how, how can you believe in that? I can't see God, so I can't believe God that I can't see. Well, but you can't see the air around us either. But you believe that it's there. You know that it's there because it's what keeps us alive. You can't see it. God is the same way. You can't see him, but you can feel him all around you. And it changes lives. Uh, I don't actually really know any pastor. Um, there's not a single pastor that I can think of that didn't come from a life that is uh, that was a complete absolute life of bondage to sin all the pastors that i know were alcoholics drug addicts wife beaters thieves um, they would worship other anything but god um, and they'll tell you these things and when there was a change um in their life when they came to know God when they came to know Jesus Christ and put their faith in him that it obviously it changed their whole lives because they became pastors and it's 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 it truly is a life-changing thing um you have that moral conscience then that's put on your life I know I know a pastor um 
who once he was saved, you know, uh, he got left in charge of cleaning the church that he was attending. And uh, because all the men, um, the men were gone. If I remember the story correctly, if, if, if I don't, it doesn't matter. Uh, all the men were at a men's retreat and there was going to be a woman's retreat or a woman's conference or something like that at church. And so he was doing, uh, doing all the cleaning and stuff like this. And he uh, had the use of the church van um, to, for transportation. And the story goes is that he was uh, at the gas station um, uh, filling up the, the, the van and had every intent of completely robbing that church because the flesh was still there the flesh was still there you know we still had this idea it's that temptation things that you know we still have um you know when it comes to overcoming our addictions when it comes to drinking we still have this urge to you know go out and do things but it's a lifestyle that we live for a long time anyway back to the story real quick because i don't want to spend a lot of time on this um he said he doesn't even really know what happened but the next thing he knew he was just driving home completely didn't uh, do uh, the 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 uh, the idea or follow through with the idea of robbing the church and all of their instruments and electro uh, electronic equipment for the sound system and things like that uh, and and that is only because God was fighting that spiritual battle for him um, because there was a change in his life uh, that caused him to not do that and that's the spiritual battle that we talk about the temptation to do these things even though we know that they're wrong we still have this temptation and that's a battle that we fight that all christians will fight because it's their desire to try to it's satan's desire to try to give us get us back into um, sin and to cause us to lose or ca cause us um, cause our soul to die spiritually spiritually and eternally uh, matthew 10 28 says do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell we don't fear as a christian we do not want to fear um, man that can kill us or anything on this planet that can kill us it's our eternal spiritual soul that and the, and the one that can send that to hell uh, in the end or let it have eternal life that is who we need to fear and if we go back and look at these words you know what uh, we use the word fear um, as being afraid of but most generally in the scripture the word fear is reverence um, I, and I didn't do a word study on this this word fear may even be two different words because we it's talking about um, the physical fear or the fear of the physical death someone that can walk up and and you know cause you to lose your life but give reverence to uh him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell does everyone know about spiritual warfare we kind of talked about this but the answer is no uh, people who are not born again uh born or born of god's spirit through faith in jesus christ are not aware of the spiritual battles because they still practice the sin and evil. They don't know that there's a battle because they're still living in sin. And, and sin doesn't have to be, uh, you know, uh, the most vile crimes that you can think of. Anyone who is not born again, who is not born uh, of God's spirits through faith in Jesus Christ is a sinner and you're living a, a life of sin. Uh, it doesn't matter how you know, good a person might think that they are. The scripture says that there is none good, no, not one, um, and that uh, we all do evil continually in our heart. It also says um, that because of Adam's sin, that we are all now born sinners. So regardless of the kind of a person that we might think that we are, um, how good we think we are, we're, we're dead in sin, and we don't recognize the spiritual warfare. Uh, we don't perceive these things because we're still we're of the flesh. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 14 says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. They don't understand these things because they don't have that relationship with God. It's just nonsense to them. It's foolishness to them. To even try to talk about this, I actually use this, um, <laughs> uh, not this scripture, but kind of a similar explanation in our men's group a couple of days ago because we got to talking about um, we're studying through the book of Ephesians and we got to talking about uh, Paul talking uh, giving a list of those who will not inherit the kingdom of heaven 
Um, and it's very clear on that. So then the question came up of, uh, you know, are you always saved or is it by grace or is it of works? Because, you know, in James it talks about works, but it talks about the justification. And that's a whole other rabbit hole that you can go down to. But the, the point that I was trying to make was if, if I were to walk up to somebody and just tell them that they're living in a life of sin, that's not going to make any sense to them. It's foolishness. They don't understand this. They don't understand even what sin is. Now, if you were to sit there and explain to them uh, about the moral law, talking through the Ten Commandments, and then asking them which ones they broke, and then asking about if a just God uh, on Judgment Day, if you, if you were up against a just, just God, regardless of what good that you think that you have done, would you be guilty or would you be innocent? And then they can start to understand that, like, well, okay, according to this, according to the Ten Commandments, then we would be considered guilty. Otherwise, <clears throat> just walking up to, t to somebody and telling them, you know, that they're living in a life of sin, they don't understand these things. Trying to explain to people who are not in the Word um, about a life of sin or about spiritual warfare and the battles that are going on around them, they just won't understand them. Um, can a believer truly love and serve Jesus and not be involved in spiritual warfare? No, we cannot. If we be believe in, know, and serve Jesus, we are going to be involved in this battle. The moment you become a child of God, your life is no longer your own. Your life belongs to God. You become a soldier of the Lord's army. 1 Corinthians 6, uh, verses 19 through 20 says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? And don't take this out of context. Some people say, well, that's why you can't get tattoos because it's the body of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, um, I'm sorry, where, because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. It, he lives in us. And when he lives in us, then then he owns us. He, we belong to him. So do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price, bought at a price. The price was the blood of Christ on the cross. He paid for our sins on that cross. The wages of sin is death, and the wages that we deserve is death. And therefore, he paid the penalty. Instead of us paying the penalty, he paid the penalty. We were paid, uh, we were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Second Timothy chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life uh, because the affairs of this life are affairs of the flesh and they will take us down that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier we are not to worry about um, the things of this world uh, none of the things of this world do not matter and the fleshly things do not matter or concern us anymore this doesn't mean that you know you can just quit your job um, that there's not responsibilities that we have because there are that we have to survive but we uh, are engaged uh, I'm sorry um, we are not to be entangled in the uh, temptations of this world or the things of this world the fleshly things of this world the fleshly pleasures of this world because again think about everything that we do um, that would be um, considered an addiction uh, and this is why I say that like all sin is is because of pride but everything that we were going to do as uh, as an addiction drugs uh, alcohol pornography sex stealing um you know, lusting, coveting, even though coveting is not a physical, lusting and coveting doesn't provide us with a physical uh, pleasure. Uh, it's the desire for that physical pleasure and so all of these other things that someone might have addiction to, caffeine, electronic devices, that is because of the, the physical pleasure that they bring us and it is, it is selfishness. We are not to bring pleasure to ourselves. We are to please him who... Uh, has enlisted us in a soldier and the him who has enlisted us as a soldier is Jesus Christ so there's no avoiding this spiritual warfare so how should we feel towards it what should our attitudes be towards spiritual warfare and the answer is positive why we are now on God's side and he wants all people to be saved God does not desire that any should perish 
he died on the cross if he died so that only some could be saved then that would be in vain the blood of the cross is for everyone it, it, it goes across the board he desires that all should be saved um, winning souls is the number one I'm sorry winning souls for the kingdom of God is the number one priority for God therefore if Satan wants to destroy all people and God wants to save them save them we will experience this spiritual warfare but we can be positive about it because we've already we know how the battle turns out read your bible you'll find out how the battle turns out we win so even though it might be tough for a little while on this earth this earth is but just you know a small speck of time in the in the the scheme of eternity the our lives are nothing but dust this time that we have is is nothing uh, the time that we're going to have in eternity, that's going to be a glorious time. So we should be positive about it. There's nothing for us to be uh, scared of or there's no reason for us to have negative thoughts about the spiritual warfare that we're going to um, encounter. <clears throat> First Timothy 2.4 Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. That is God. The who is God. Him who desires this. Uh, so he desires that all men would come to know God. Uh, you can also find in 2 Peter 3, 9, um, it's one that's not here, but it says that he is willing that none should perish. 2 Peter 3, 9. Um, he didn't die for some. Only some will come to him, but he didn't die for some. He died for all. And you can see that uh, the, the word none in 2 Peter 3, 9, it means none. And like if you were to reword that, that he died for all or that he is willing that all should live Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 through 20 another verse that says that he is willing that none should perish it says go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you and lo I am with you always even to the end of the age amen this is God's command to the disciples um, right before he ascends into heaven, but it's also our command. It can't just be for them. If we have been made disciples, then it is our job to go make disciples. We, as Christians, have a duty to go out and share um, God's word. It doesn't mean you have to go be a street evangelist, but it does mean that we need to live that lifestyle, that godly lifestyle, and be able to share the word of God um, and the hope that we have with the people that we encounter uh, in our daily lives and a lot, it's going to bring a lot of um, hostility towards us especially in today's uh, day and age with it it just seems like everything is going downhill so rapidly in our country just over the past couple of years things have just drastically changed and maybe I didn't pay attention enough before because even though I never did lose my faith in God I was living um, a non-godly lifestyle. I was living a life of sin. And so maybe I just didn't notice it. And, and that's why it seems like uh, it's such a big deal now. But um, I don't think that anybody can deny with the things that are, are going on, the social issues that are going on um, in our world with abortion becoming just as prevalent as it is. And, and now in some states, including the one that I live in, talking about perinatal abortion, which means that it's on either side of the birth, which means that the baby would have been born, which negates the argument that it's not a human being because it hasn't been born yet and it still depends on mom. Now the baby can have been born and mom would be like, nah, I decided I don't want it. Um, and they can opt for abortion. We see this with the homosexuality, with the transgenderism, with the um, uh, forceful almost introduction of um, sexual orientation uh, and, and just anything that has to do with sexuality at all. Um, into our school systems and not just you know in the sex education class that you get in high school but all the way down into elementary school I think it becomes very apparent that things are, are going downhill so there's going to be um, there's going to be opposition uh, but we are still called to do it and this, the Bible says that it's not going to be easy and there are, are people that are going to come out against us but we are supposed to continue to uh, go out and share God's word so there's some facts about spiritual warfare. Uh, now that we've established the reality of the spiritual warfare and that we can't escape it, we need to learn how to survive this invisible battle. Uh, but just because it doesn't, it's invisible, remember, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. The first thing to remember is that the battle is the Lord's. 1 Samuel 17, 47. It's not our battle. 
It's a battle that's going on around us and trying to kill us, but we can't fight it. We must be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. This is when um, in Ephesians chapter 6, this verse uh, is the beginning of Paul's talk and explanation of spiritual warfare. We have no natural power to defeat the forces of darkness. If, uh, if we're to be victorious, if I am to be victorious, I must draw my strength from the Lord. It's not a battle that we can fight on our own uh, without without God, without the helper, without someone on your side in the spiritual battle, how are you going to fight an invisible battle that's going on? You can't, you can't fight it. We don't fight against flesh and blood. Remember, it is a spiritual battle that goes on around us um, as Satan tries to kill us. So, um, can the wicked one, who is Satan or the devil, touch me? And who lies under Satan's control or under Satan's uh, power. First John 5, 18 and 19 says, We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The world is in darkness. They, uh, the unbelievers, are the ones who lie, <clears throat> excuse me, the ones who lie under his sway. They are the ones that he has control over. He can't kill you. He's going to try to kill you, even though he can't, he's going to make your life as miserable as possible. But that's why we need to go back and, as it says, um, be strong in the Lord and the power of his, of his might because the battle belongs to the Lord. It's not a battle that we can fight on our own. Uh, why does Satan, or the God of this age, blind people? 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine on them. Light and darkness, <coughs> excuse me, light and darkness cannot exist together. So when Satan has you blinded, you're living in darkness because his goal, again, is to bring spiritual death. And when you're blind, you won't see the light. Kind of go back to the explanation that I gave a little bit ago. When you go and talk to somebody and just say that, you know, that they are, you're living in a life of sin and you're going to go to hell. That makes no sense to them because they are blinded and it becomes foolishness. Um, once that light shines on them and they come to that realization, they're drawn to God, whether it's because of, you know, um, you talking to them or, you know, some, whatever it is that draws them to God, then they will continue to live in um, darkness. And the problem is, is like the world loves the darkness because they don't want to have that accountability. That's why things are the way that they are in our world where we're trying to live in darkness. We're trying to suppress the truth. I actually saw something um, the other day, I think it was yesterday, about the state of California wanting to ban Bibles because Bibles speak out against homosexuality and transgenderism, even though the word transgenderism is not in the Bible. It, it clearly says in the Bible, God made them uh, male and female. It also says that um, if you lie with a, a male as, uh, as you would a female and vice versa, uh, if you're a female that lies with a, uh, a female the way you would with a man, then it's an abomination. And these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. It speaks out about these things. It speaks out about abortion. It might not use the word abortion, but you can go back into, I believe it's in Deuteronomy. It could be in Numbers. I don't remember now off, off the top of my head. Um, but any time in the Bible they talk about sacrificing their um, child to Moloch, passing their children through the fire. That's literally where we are in this society. Yes, it's a, a procedure that happens in a hospital instead of when the baby is born, but let's go back and think about this. If you can murder the baby after it's born, it is no different than putting uh, your living baby that's already been born on the outstretched arms of this idol um, who promises prosperity uh, and burning your child to death. That is passing your child through the fire. The, the, the world does not like the truth the world does not like the light, and, and the, what it boils down to is people don't want to be responsible. Um, but we're all going to be held accountable um, at some point. The Bible says that we're all going to be held accountable at some point. So the world lives in darkness, and the, um, the light, light and darkness cannot uh, coexist. And so Satan has the world blinded to prevent the the light of the gospel of Christ, which is the good news of Christ from shining in. Second Timothy 
2, 23 through 26 says, But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, uh, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their own senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Um, have been taken captive by Satan to do his will, which is evil and which is to live in darkness and to oppress the truth. They want to to suppress the truth. And um, <clears throat> it is our job, as it says here, um, to be gentle, to be able to, to teach, to be patient uh, in humility and correcting those who are in opposition. Uh, again, we're going to have opposition to that uh, because the world doesn't want to see it, but it's still our job. It's still a Christian's job. And beyond that, it is the church's job to stand up for what is right and not just sit back and let sin and death reign and just go through this world. Even though we know that that's what's going to continue to happen, um, it's still our job to share the gospel. So what must believers um, avoid and why? Foolish and ignorant, you can find this in verse 23. Um, we should avoid, we must avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife, that they're going to cause opposition between us. Like uh, going back to oh, the conversation that we had in our men's study a couple of weeks ago, um, it was one of the guys that was believing that I could, I was saying that you could lose your faith, and it really kind of brought up, it was a, it was a 45 minute uh, kind of semi heated. Uh, discussion that came up, but that's ridiculous for us to come up in the, in the church to fight with that if it's completely not biblically right. My point was that the Bible says that these people will not inherit the kingdom of God, uh, but it's not of works, it's of grace. Again, Ephesians 2 8. These little things that come up in the church uh, that cause division and strife with us, um, they when they cause that division, then it causes us to not be able to share the gospel correctly. Um, and, and when we bring up arguments that are not salvation issues, uh, specifically with people that aren't Christians, like everything that when we talk about, um, when we talk about the Bible, it needs to be about salvation with someone that's a non-believer. It needs to be a salvation issue. And the same thing goes within the church. If it's not a salvation issue, then it's a matter of a difference of, uh, of theology, uh, theology. But you can't have that variation when it comes to salvation. You can't say things like it's a work, uh, that salvation is a, is a work and it's not by grace. Um, but these foolish and ignorant disputes between uh, the church itself or um, with non-believers, if it's with a non-believer, it's just going to cause them to want to stay living in darkness and they're not going to want to see the light. So, what must we do in verse 24? It says, uh, let us not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach and be patient. We have to be able to teach, we have to be willing to teach, and we have to be patient with those that don't understand because they're living in, uh, in blindness, they're living in darkness. How are we to correct those who are blinded by Satan? In humility, this is talking not about believers and within the church, but those who are blinded by the outside. In humility, um, we must be humble about it, not proud and puffed up like I know better than you. We must do it in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, sharing the truth, uh, so that if God perhaps will grant them repentance. Um, and it's not that God's going to say no. It's that they can see the truth and be, be granted that repentance, the turning away from sins by them, uh, turning their lives over to God, accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, being born again like we talked about at the very beginning, uh, and that they uh, will, will no longer be blinded, um, but they will know the truth. And then why has Satan taken every non-believer captive? That they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive uh, by him to do his will. They have been taken captive um, by Satan, to do his will, and his will is share this truth uh, and to cause division and um, strife and uh, to share darkness and to continue to live in darkness. Uh, that is what his will is. Last slide. I know we're at almost 40 minutes here, but this is the last slide. Now, these are all facts. 
As a believer in Christ, it is important to see things as God does and realize that we are always victorious through Jesus. Even so, Satan will try many different tactics to discourage and distract us from the plans God has for our lives. Satan will try to pull us from God and try to still continue to get us to do his will um, and, and distract us from the plans that God has in our lives. And here's the thing. We talked about this today in, uh, in children's church. Um, as we were going through the the seven C's, which is not something I'm going to get into on this. Most people, not most people, a lot of people will say that the Bible is just a fairy tale written by a bunch of old men and that it's been misquoted and mistranslated and it's a bunch of mythological stories. The reality of it is fairy tales and mythological stories have not ever um, had any sort of a factual basis to them. Um, the, the Bible was written by 40 different men, uh, in three different languages on three different continents over a period of 1600 years, but it agrees with itself 100% of the time, uh, morally, um, morally, uh, prophetically and historically, um, the Bible is a book that has been used, uh, to find you know, settlements that were destroyed in the flood. It's been used uh, for geographic um, discoveries. It's something that when it was not mistranslated or not even translated, but when the manuscripts were copied, it was something that was done with great detail uh, by the scribes. And this is something that, you know, it's not like just somebody, it wasn't like they just gave me a book and said, copy this. And I just did it willy nilly. The, the scribes that copied this book were very meticulous about it. Any discrepancies that it has are minor grammatical or spelling or uh, errors. I almost said punctuation, but they're not punctuation errors because um, there was no punctuation in Hebrew. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a factual book. And there's a couple of books that you can um, go and uh, look at that I would highly recommend that you go and look at. Uh, the first one is A Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, um, and the second one is Evidence That Demands a Verdict, and that's not a book that, it's, it's, um, it's like an educational book, almost like a textbook. It's very dry, but it's, it's got a bunch of really good information in it. That was written by Josh McDowell. Josh McDowell and both, uh, uh, both Josh McDowell and Lee Strobel uh, were atheists who set out to disprove, um, the, the existence of Jesus and the death and resurrection on the cross and by the end of the day when they finished their um, their studying um, Josh McDowell or I'm sorry Lee Strobel was was doing interviews uh, with people to try to disprove this and he that's where the the book the case for Christ came from and in his search to try to disprove him doing these interviews with people and uh, looking and digging up the facts he ended up becoming a Christian and more than not proved um, the existence and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, so I say that these are facts because the Bible has been proven historically. Uh, people that say that the, the Bible is not uh, historical, that the Bible is just mythological, that the Bible is a fairy tale, have never run it, never read it, and never done any research out of whatever kind of negative research it is to try to disprove the Bible that people do. Um, they can be proven. So these things are facts. Spiritual warfare happens. I know that it happens because I experience it. Being a Christian, it, it, it happens all the time. We have these temptations. We have these desires. We know that they're wrong. And that's just Satan trying to take us down and, and kill us. The Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. 2 Thessalonians 3.3. 3. The Lord is faithful. He will guard us. We can't do uh, we can't do it on our own. We can't fight the battle on our own. We can't fight the battle at all, uh, aside from staying grounded in God's word and being focused on Him. Uh, that is how um, that's how we fight this battle. That's the only way to fight this battle. So that's it for this uh, lesson, guys. Um, uh, we'll try to get the next one out next Sunday. Here's some contact information for you. You can uh, um, contact me in my email soberchristian22 at gmail.com the website www.soberforchrist.com again there's resources on there and a contact form and then there is the facebook group and it's a private group um, which i kind of created with the intent of maybe some people wanting to share um, you know addiction stories or ask for help or 
or you know guidance when it comes to the Bible and things like that. Uh, what I've noticed is that uh, a lot of what happens on there is uh, just people sharing um, Bible verses and things like that. That's perfectly fine. It's a good place to go. I put these videos on there. I put other videos on there. Um, there's a lot of good information uh, post the church um, Sunday and Wednesday lessons on there. There's just a lot of, I think, a lot of good stuff on there that somebody who was wanting to know God and get closer to God um, could use. Uh, so that's it for this episode, guys, um, for this lesson, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we'll be back hopefully next week. I'll be able to get one done um, for next Sunday. And uh, until I see you guys next time, uh, remember that the battle is going around, uh, around uh, going on around us, and it's not our battle to fight aside from giving it to God. It's his battle to fight. He's the only one that can win it. There's nothing that we can do to fight off Satan except for give the battle to God and let him fight the battle for us. So uh, until next time, stay grounded, stay in God's word. God bless and have a great day.